All right, everybody, we're going to get started here. Um, welcome to Serial Killer. Uh, this is Hack the Cloud, uh, Adam Ely. And uh, yeah, take it away, Adam. Okay. Uh, show of hands, who's actually awake this morning? Okay, that's all. That's way more than I expected, because me, not so much. I'm like three hours ahead of my local time zone, two hours of sleep last night. Yeah, you're in for an interesting ride this morning. We'll see how this goes. Okay, so we're uh, in the serial killer track, which is just awesome to me, right? Because we're going to hack the cloud. All right, so we're going to talk a little cloud security today. And I was going to do this whole corny intro with serial killers saying, like, hack the planet and replace it with cloud. And I was like, I'm not that creative. I can't figure that one out. So we're just going to skip that whole part and kind of jump into it. So how many people, first, I want to kind of get an idea of who's in the room, because I like to tailor things, kind of go really off the cuff in the middle of my presentation. So how many people here are, you know, enterprises or, you know, some kind of company, and you're struggling with securing cloud resources and services? Okay, a couple. How many of you here are pen testers, whatever, and your job is to go assess cloud services? Okay, a couple more. Why are the rest of you here? Seriously, that was like 2% of all of you, okay? Uh, so feedback during the, convert, during the presentation, yell out questions, insult me, tell me where I'm doing good, it's all fine, okay? Let's make this very interactive, especially this early in the morning. Can you hear me? That's better? All right, see? That's what we need, lots of feedback, all right. All right, so quick disclaimer. So when I first um, was asked to give this presentation, I was the CISO of Heroku at Salesforce. So I was a CISO of a cloud service provider. Technically, I was really a CSO because all of it reported up to me, but that was my title. So when I first w uh, was scheduled to come give this presentation, I was 100% biased, right? I was going to come. I was going to tote the company line. Cloud is safe. We love the cloud, all of that. Since then, I've left Salesforce. I can say whatever the hell I want now. So you ask me, I will tell you. I have no problems with it. So yeah, that is great for you guys. Here is my shameless plug. This is the only shameless plug, I think, in the entire presentation. I have a new company, Blue Box Security. We are hiring. Those are positions that I'm hiring. If you, you know, want a job, if you want to talk, if you know anybody wants a job, referral fee, that's what I'm looking for right now. Really, we are hiring. Let me just make sure this is very clear. We're still hiring. These are a lot of the perks, right, that we have. It's really cool stuff. Okay. All right, so now, why you're listening to me? This is basically the, hey, look at me, this is why I'm up here on the stage slide, right? And so, this is why I'm qualified to talk about cloud and security and whatever. I've been in this game a really, really long time. How many people were around for these? How many people know all these acronyms? Yeah, that's what I thought, not very many of you, huh? So, back in 99, I started my career. Well, so I was consulting for the government before that, but 99, I started my corporate career at, for a company called TRX. We launched um, the travel management systems at City. We launched Expedia. We launched Orbitz, or part of Orbitz. We were a SaaS before it existed, right? But back then, we called it ASP, Application uh, Solution Provider. And then, well, that was bad. Nobody liked that. So we were OSP. We're outsourced. We're outsourced. Outsourced sounds better for some reason, right? Oh, crap. Then that was bad a couple years later. So we were hosted solution provider, right? This is all marketing. It was the same technology, same terms, everything. SaaS. Um, I was going to say ass, but yeah. Uh, and then pass all came much, much later. So anyway, I've been, since about 99, I've been leading security companies and dealing with cloud, right? Um, so I know a lot of acronyms. I have a lot of acronyms, which is unfortunate some days, depending on the conversations you follow on Twitter. But it is what it is. All right. So first, before we really get in, let's talk about cloud. What is cloud? How do we define cloud? If you read articles about cloud, if you talk to people about cloud, it's such a generic term, nobody knows what it means. It's like, oh, cloud, and you, just, and you go, oh, EC2? Or you go cloud, and you go, Salesforce? You go cloud, you go, you know, what is it, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit about cloud first, and then we'll start diving in and see where we go. So first type of cloud we have, the lowest level, right, is infrastructure as a service. Infrastructure as a service is, you know, renting hardware or renting instances that run on hardware. So this is like your rack spaces, your EC2, stuff like that. How many people employ some kind of system like this in their uh, enterprise right now? It's here. Okay, not many. Well, surprising. Usually when I talk to people, that's much, much higher. They're all kind of moving to uh, augmenting their, their infrastructure with some kind of um, uh, rented hardware. Then if you move up the stack one level, 
you have the platform as a service, right? So this is where Heroku ran, right? So when I was at Salesforce, the division I ran was Heroku. And so this is where we ran. So we basically ran the um, you know, application level down, so, or application services, right? So the web services, databases, whatever. You wrote your code, threw it on our platform, ran it. Hopefully it worked. <laughs> Sometimes it didn't, but hopefully it did. And you know, we took care of everything else. And then if you go up a level, you have what most people would call cloud, right? So SaaS, when, when we talk about cloud, most people think SaaS, right? This is a, it's a service, it's an application out there, I'm gonna go use it, and hopefully everything's gonna be good, whatever. So this is your work days, your sales forces, your, you know, whatever's, right? So how many people are using some sort of SaaS in their environment right now? Okay, almost everybody. How many people are using something like a Pass, a Heroku, uh, Google um, um, App Engine, or whatever it's called, something like that? Okay, like two or three. Okay, that one's still very interesting. Not a lot of people have moved to that model yet. Okay, that's the really dangerous model because you can screw yourself. All right, so then what really happens is once you look at all these, you realize this is really what cloud is. Cloud is always really a combination of services, right? It's a stacking of services. So give me a, give me a SaaS vendor somebody uses right now. Really, anybody? You all raise your hands that you use SaaS vendors and nobody has an example? Hold on, sorry. Box? Box? Okay. So I heard somebody say box, I think. I don't know. Um, so we'll just go with that. <laughs> um, so if you go look at box, right, and you go crawl through their website and you look at, you know, where they're pulling images from, where they're storing things, you realize box is a combination of services. You go to Salesforce, you go to Workday, you go to any of these guys, and you realize they're a combination of services. They're storing stuff on EC2. Uh, they're storing stuff on Amazon's S3, they're using Rackspace, they're using Akamai, they're using all these other services to come together to bring one big service that they then give to you. So it's a combination of services. So cloud is really a service of things, right? It's a bunch of things, and these things stack up to be the cloud that you then get the service for and that you then have to audit and, and deal with, right? Very simple. All right. And so then we, once we understand that there's a, a stack of things, right, there's, a, there's all these things that go into it, and we understand the types of cloud services that are out there, we can start talking about the areas of risk, right? So you have the infrastructure stuff. Infrastructure is the lowest level. They don't build an application for you. They're not running a website, right? It's your application, it's a vendor's application, whomever. And so what you're really concerned at this level is, well, what's the security of the hardware, the virtual instance they're giving me, or their people, or their internal security policies? And that's what you have to deal with when you're talking to these guys. Now, if you go up the stack to somebody like uh, our Heroku and you look at the pass, now they're providing you an OS, they're providing you the uh, you know, uh, web server configurations, they're providing you the database. Now you have to worry about that level of security and you have to start auditing them. Right? So as you go up the stack, it gets more complicated. Then you get to SaaS. And SaaS now is where most people are used to auditing and most people are used to uh, thinking about cloud, and so they're like, oh, the cross-site scriptings and the SQL injections and the whatevers of the world, this is where they start to think, right? And so as you move up the stack, you have to worry about different security levels, but at the end of the day, you really have to think about all of it because it's just, you know, a service of things. So how many people right now are auditing cloud vendors? That is a dismal number of people. Shame on all of you, okay? Shame. So, um... Let me, let me ask, somebody, if somebody doesn't mind saying, and we'll try to actually capture the real input this time, uh, somebody who's not auditing their cloud or SaaS vendors, can somebody shout out why they're not doing that right now? Excellent. <laughs> Love that answer. Somebody else is doing it. That's the best kind of work right there when somebody else does it. Okay. Uh, anybody who is just is not getting done at all want to shout out why? Yeah, I didn't really think anybody was gonna go for answering that question. Okay, <laughs> all right, so um, when we start talking about cloud security and we start talking about auditing and you know, what the security problems are and how we're gonna break into the cloud, you know, we, there's a couple things that we have to think about first. And the first thing is we have to think differently, right? When we audit a cloud or we go out to look at a cloud service, the technology is the same stuff we've always seen. Cloud is not new, it's not unique. It's been around for a very long time. That's why I started this presentation with my story of back in 1999, I was doing cloud, right? It's been around a long time. All the technology stack has been around. If you go look at Heroku at Salesforce, right? Linux operating systems, Postgres database, run Varnish, uh, run Apache, run all these different you know, services, all stuff that you've seen everywhere else. 
But the difference is that it's somebody else managing it, it's bundled differently, it's integrated with a bunch of other services. You just have to think differently about it when you look at it and you approach it, right? But the technology is all the same. So the first thing I always tell people is, and I'm gonna go out of order on this, it's gonna confuse you there for a second, is accept the transfer of risk. Whenever you're looking at a cloud service and you're like, oh, I wanna use this cloud service, but you know the security and I'm concerned and you know all of this, you have to let go a little bit. You can't be a control freak. You have to step back a bit and say, oh, well, somebody else is managing this. I'm paying them to manage this. I have to realize that I'm gonna give up something. I'm gonna give up some control. Just like if you're a vendor, any kind of vendor, if you're selling a product, if you're selling a service, whatever, to another company, they're giving up control for you. How many of your consultants? Okay, small amount. Okay, so consultants know this, right? Consultants come into an organization and they say, oh, we need to do this, we need to do that, whatever. And the internal IT guy or internal security guy is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, this is my thing. This is what I do. You know, why, why are you messing in my playground, right? And the consultant's like, well, I'm here to help, right? And there's always this little, or not always, but many times there's this little friction, right? Same happens in cloud. We've got to step back from that friction and say, okay, well, let's let the, you know, uh, vendor manage their security and do what they do. And it'll always work out a little bit better. And then the next thing we have to think about is that once we get over that, we have to say, oh, not all vendors are the same. How many of you have security audit checklists that you send to your vendors? Oh, I know there's more than, than that. Oh, I know. Because I've, I've been on this side of it too many times. I know that at least 75% of you in here have some questionnaire that you send to vendors that's like 300 questions in Excel, has absolutely nothing to do with what you're auditing, but that's what you're going to send them to piss them off anyway. You all know that I'm right. I've been on this side way too many times. So don't be that guy, right? So the big, the worst damn thing ever is when, <clears throat> when I work for one of these vendors and I get this questionnaire, it's got 11 tabs in Excel, it's way too damn big. It's got 11 tabs, there's 300 questions per tab and they're like, answer all these questions. I'm like, N-A, 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 N-A. And then I get some email back from a risk analyst going, you are not allowed to answer these N-A. Well, they're not applicable. What do you want me to tell you? All right, cool, I'll just make shit up all day long, whatever. I don't care if you need an answer, I'll give you one, whatever, right? Anyway, don't be that guy. Think about it before you do this, right? Because um, you need to walk through it. When you, when you audit these services, you need to think about it and rationalize the risk. You need to figure out what the risk of each service is so that when you go in there and you say, okay, I'm gonna threat model this out real quick uh, and say, okay, here's the risk that are to my business and I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna assess this or I'm gonna audit this or you know, I'm gonna send them damn boring ass checklist, whatever it is, but it needs to be relevant. So, you know, don't come in and ask like a thousand questions about PCI for something that has nothing to do with that. Don't ask a thousand things about Windows when it's all Linux, you know, whatever. This is the biggest thing that holds many organizations back in the cloud is that they send these ridiculous checklists out and they go, oh, they failed the checklist. Well, the problem wasn't the security of the vendor, the problem was the damn checklist in the first place. Okay, anyway, that's my checklist rant. All right, I have to get that one out because I hate the damn checklist. It. And, and I'm responsible for building half of these damn things, so I, I take a lot of fault in that. <laughs> All right, so next thing is we move into know thyself, right? So now that we understand that we must think differently and we must approach differently, we have to kind of start to think about ourselves. What are we trying to get out of our security program? What actually matters to us? What are we actually addressing in the cloud, right? And so we have to develop our security baseline. We have to say, you know, these are the things that we care about. These are the things that we're trying to achieve. These are the things that we're gonna make our vendors achieve and this is how we're gonna approach it. Now, if you go look at like uh, Cloud Security Alliance and there's a couple other random organizations out there trying to do stuff, they're trying to help with this, trying to build that baseline to bridge that gap between the traditional, okay, hey, here's our NIST standard and whatever we're using in our enterprise and here's how you can kind of tailor the wording and the presentation and everything to the cloud services. It, it's still young, right? We're in our infancy of that, but you know, we're making strides there. And again, the technology hasn't changed, we just need to change our mindset and how we approach it. And so as we figure that part out, then we understand the different kinds of services, which we just talked about. And so when we go in and assess something, we go, okay, what kind of service are we actually assessing? Why do we want to uh, assess this? When I was at Heroku, we were a platform as a service, right? So platforms as a service, we ran the stack, you wrote and deployed your code. Numerous organizations daily would call me and say, hey, what are you guys doing about SQL injection in my code? I'm not doing a damn thing about SQL injection in your code. What are you doing? They were so surprised. The security guys were like, whoa, 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 what up? Hold, hold on, this is cloud. You're, you're not protecting me from SQL injection? Nah, are you protecting yourself? Apparently not, because you're waiting for me to do it. 
I didn't write the code. It wasn't my code to manage. It was their code, right? But they had no concept of what they were looking at, right? I had a team come in and do a uh, security review, right? They came in, they did the audit and the paper stuff and whatever, right? There's documents flying around. Then they brought their elite pen testers in and their pen testers stop and go, oh, y'all didn't write the code. I go, yeah, no shit, we didn't write the code. We're platforms of service. <laughs> that was great money spent on that engagement for the client, right? So understand the service that you guys are looking at before you get there. Otherwise, you waste a bunch of money and a bunch of people's time and, you know, annoy the fuck out of me. But, well, you would have. Not anymore because I'm not there, but you would have. Uh, and so, you know, this is still, like, the largest problem that I see right here. Understanding what really is at risk and who owns what. It seems to be very confusing for many companies these days. And we, as an industry, just need to get better communication around that, I think. Um, and then, uh, again, we talk about the exceptions to transfer risk. I put that on here twice because it's still a really, really big thing. We are, we are we're control freaks by nature in this industry, right? Which, hey, we need to be, right? I'm, I've been in this industry like 15 years, and I'm definitely a control freak. You can ask anybody who works for me. Um, but we have to step back when we're talking about cloud and outsourcing vendors and partners. We have to step back a little bit, which is hard to do, right? Because our security is our baby, and that's what we do, and we love, and that's our job. And well, if it goes upside down, we're the ones who get fired, not the accountants. So, you know, but we have to learn to do that. All right. So now we move into the assessment phase. And this is where we're going to start talking about uh, the security cloud a little bit. I'm going to go a little off cuff in presentation here. And this is where I want your feedback. This is where I want you guys to start shouting out things and go, hey, I'm looking at vendor XYZ and what should I look for? Or, hey, I have this concern. Or, hey, what's the biggest insecure thing you know about in the cloud services? Whatever. I just want you guys to shout things out and, and let's kind of wake the rest of these people up this morning because this guy over here is sleeping. He's sleeping right there. Um, anyway, so the assessment phase, <laughs> there he goes, he woke up. Welcome, hey, how you doing this morning? No, I was fucking with you. Um, okay, so the first thing on assessments, uh, oh yeah, I'm a dick, sorry. Um, so first thing on assessments, you're not getting everything for $8 a month. All right, so there's a CEO of this cloud uh, provider, and when I used to write for Information Week part-time, I'm doing an interview with him, and I'm like, hey, what if I want to come in and I want to assess your service? He goes, sure. He goes, I got these documents. I'll send you whatever. You want to run a pen test, whatever. Have fun. I don't care. I go, okay, what if I want to come see your data center? What if I want to talk to your staff? What if I want to look through your you know, operating procedure? He goes, dude, you pay me $8 a month. Piss off. That's literally what he said to me. And I was like, God, first of all, you got balls. Second of all, you're right. I pay you $8 a month. How much security do I get for $8 a month? Not very much, right? Not very much. So, <laughs> so yeah, you know, at eight dollars a month, don't expect everything, right? So look at the kind of service, and if it's like eight dollars a month, don't expect that like it's gonna be super badass security, unless the company is very progressive and you know whatever. They just have an awesome security team. Like it's like the guys at Box. Like I know the security guys at Box. Like they're really awesome. There's a lot of shit they'll do for you, but for the fifteen or so dollars a month they charge per user, there's a limit, right? So just remember that. All right, so next thing is work with the provider. How many of you have ever truly tried to work with uh, an external provider like a SaaS, you know, cloud vendor, whatever, on their security to truly understand, you know, what they have and give them feedback as well? Have you? Okay. And have you given them feedback and be like, hey, this is what I would like to see, like, just non-confrontational, like, hey, I want to talk to you? Interesting. Yeah, those guys at Salesforce are dicks. <laughs> Seriously, I want to talk to them. No, I'm just playing. Love Salesforce. Salesforce is awesome. Talk to them. No, Salesforce guys are good. So, what, so this is a great case. Most of the people that I talked to and most of the people that came to me were like, oh my God, I'm big enterprise and here's my security checklist and we're going to run a vulnerability assessment and we're going to tell you how your security is and all this. I'm like, cool, whatever. And so they come back and they're like, well, you should do this, this, and this. I'm like, no. Nah. I'm like, but they never want to have the conversation. They want to dictate to me. And I'm like, dude, it's my service. I run the service. Your customers, your internal customers or your customer customers, they, they want the service. <laughs> I kind of trump you here. Like, I'm providing what, what they want. Like, let's be honest, I'm aligned with the business. They want this. So dictating to me, probably not really going to work so much. But having a conversation with me and saying, hey, how about this? Or could we do this? Or help us understand this. I had an entire guy on my team, a senior like principal engineer, dedicated to going to talk to customers just for cool shit. 
seriously, he was the senior, uh, senior principal security engineer of cool shit, I think is what we actually put on his business card. He would literally just go out and talk to customers and customers would be like, yeah, we really like to be able to backhaul all of our logs. Cool, what does that look like? You want it to syslog, what do you want? You know, unless he goes, one customer's like, no, really what we want is we want to be able to run an agent on our side that subscribes to a queue on your side and pops it off so we can get it real time, but we don't have to open the firewall and all this. We're like, all right, cool, 45 days later, it's in production, right? Like I had a senior principal security engineer of cool shit. Like it was the most awesome job. I wanted it because he didn't have to do all the paperwork that I had to do, so it's quite nice. So anyway, work with your vendors. Like most people never try to actually really work with the vendors. So these guys, they went out and they talked to Salesforce about HIPAA and I know what they told you. Like I know the exact story because I've been on the other side of that conversation at Salesforce. So I know exactly what they said there. They're kind of dicks on that one. Um, but no, I'm playing, love Salesforce, just playing. No, um, so always try to work with your vendor. Most cloud vendors are really open if you approach them in a like uh, collaborative manner and don't try to position as hey, I'm big enterprise, or hey, I'm the customer. If you just work with them and say, hey, here's some cool nifty shit that I want, most of the security teams will talk to you and it's very, very easy. Now your smaller vendors get more defensive uh, because of market play. So that kind of sucks. Uh, and when you're having those conversations, communicate intent, not implementation. When somebody would come to me, a client would come to me and say, hey, you have to implement this, you have to do this. I had a vendor one time come and say, you have to implement these firewalls and here's our standard. <laughs> I was like, dude, I'm in the cloud. How do you get an ASA in the cloud? <laughs> like, if you do that, that's an amazing feat. Cisco will buy that from you. <laughs> I'm like, like, that doesn't work. And they could not grasp it. So they're like, well, you have to install ASAs. I'm like, where? <laughs> I'm like, you must tell me to data. Okay, sure, whatever. I mean, the co if the contract's big enough, I will go buy a set of ASAs, go stick them in data, and they're not going to do anything. But whatever, I will do that. Whatever you want. Anyway, the problem was they were trying to tell me the actual implementation of how they did it, not the intent of what they want. If they had talked intent, they would have realized I already had it, right? I already was doing all of that. So I had another customer come to me and talk to me about web application security. And he tried to tell me about SQL injection. Funny story about that in a second. And I was explaining to what we do and how we're not vulnerable and, and all of this kind of thing. And he could not grasp it because we didn't do things the quote unquote traditional way. And at one point he ended up telling me that I did not understand SQL injection. Fast forward to right now, the guy who discovered SQL injection heads up my research team at my new company. Like I understand SQL injection inside and out. It's not a new concept, like I get this. But go back four months and there's a guy telling me that I have no concept of this because my implementation was different than his, right? That is so damn annoying. So work with your vendor and communicate that intent as you're going through it because it'll help you tailor your assessment as well to understand how did they implement things, what are they doing, where do you really need to threat model their business, and how do you really focus on uh, the true security there, uh, you know, all the way from architecture to everything else. So where to start? All right, so this is where I want to hear from you guys because I'm tired of talking, right? It's early. I want to go take a nap. I get early, so you guys need to do some talking as well. So if you're auditing, you know, or going to do a pen test, security review, whatever, of a cloud service, be it SaaS or whatever, where do you start? Really? You guys are killing me this morning. No, read the manual. Always read the damn manual. Always. So... <laughs> Always read the damn manual, everything. Doesn't matter what you assess, this is the oldest rule. How many of you are pen testers or have a pen test background? Okay, that explains a lot of why nobody got that one. Okay, so when I used to do pen testing, right? So I, so I, was, at a, I was at a presentation, I was at SummerCon. Anybody ever been to SummerCon? No? Okay, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know what y'all out here in the Midwest like. This is my first trip to the Midwest, by the way. I'm enjoying it quite, quite, quite a bit. I discovered this thing last night called Bob Evans. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> I was like, who the fuck is Bob Evans and why does he have so many places? And I'm like, whatever, this is awesome. So um, I'm enjoying my trip to the Midwest thus far. So anyway, uh, SummerCon is a drunken conference, right? SummerCon 2000 actually didn't happen because everybody was so hungover, the entire conference got canceled the next day. True story, right? I was there, I was like, what the fuck, where's the conference? Oh shit, okay, everybody just hungover. It technically started around 6.30, the uh, day that it was supposed to start in the bar and just it was just a continuation of drug from the night before. It was really bad. Anyway, fast forward a couple years later, I'm at this conference and I'm watching this guy at SummerCon, maybe, I don't know, 2007 in Atlanta. And he's on stage and he is literally drinking out of four beers at one time and people are throwing shoes. 
I don't know. I don't understand why I was there the entire day. It was not like on the agenda, throw shoe now. Like, I don't know. Shoes just started flying. <clears throat> but the guy said something that was really interesting to me, right? He was talking about web application security. He's got a huge background. Uh, if you guys know web application security, the, the speaker was Billy Hoffman. And so Billy is up there and he's talking and he's saying, okay, where do you start when you assess a web application? And people are like, oh, you scan it, you spider it, you do all these things. He goes, no, you read the fucking manual first. <laughs> he's like, you gotta figure out what the software is and what it does. The manual will normally tell you the most uh, of what you need right off the bat so that you can understand the application and find all the weak points. Cloud services are the same thing. They have about pages, they have FAQs. Hell, if you go to Heroku, Heroku has an entire developer section of the website that actually talks about the code, how it runs, all of this. You go to their GitHub page, there's all kinds of open source projects that actually run in production. It's like your roadmap for hacking them right there. It's the most awesome thing ever. Now, of course, for my role when I was there, it was not awesome because I have this platform that anybody can write hostile code, upload it to the platform, execute on the platform. Fuck me. <laughs> like, just attack me from within my platform. Awesome. About, about two weeks into that job, I was like, why the hell did I take this job? <laughs> Okay, so anyway, so you read the manual, but not only do you read the manual, you read the manual of all the things, right? So if you're gonna go and you're gonna try to hack one of these services, or you're gonna try to pen test it, you're gonna try to audit it, you go, okay, I'm gonna go look at the Heroku platform. What does Heroku use? Heroku uses AWS services from Amazon, EC2, S3, all these things. Oh, it uses Redis to go. Oh, it uses SendGrid, uses all these different services. All right, so now I'm gonna start to map out and say, oh, here's all the touch points. Here is everything that it, uses, it utilizes. I'm gonna go read all the manuals on those to fully understand what they do, how they integrate, and start to find my weaknesses. This is the weakness of the cloud services. Cloud services are much like Ruby code. First of all, any Ruby developers in here? Excellent, Ruby developers suck. All right, so <laughs> the problem with Ruby developers are they don't write anything new. And okay, I, I, I employ a team of Ruby developers, and I give them this shit all the time, because I also employ a team of Java developers, and so I love to start a little Java Ruby war. It's quite interesting for me to watch during the day in my Skype chat, so it's fun for me, not so much for them. But anyway, if you look at the Ruby world, right, in the Ruby world, nobody really writes new stuff. Everybody builds upon other people's stuff. So I was debugging somebody's code the other day, and I'm looking at this uh, SOAP client, right, to make uh, calls to this uh, SOAP API. Yeah, when I actually got down to the bug, which was an OpenSSL bug, I had to go through three HTTP implementations to get there. It was a SOAP client on top of an HTTP client, on top of an HTTP client, on top of the native Ruby HTTP client, on top of OpenSSL. That's how cloud services are. Crap like Ruby, no, I'm just fine. So, but that's how cloud services are. They're a hodgepodge and they're a stack of a bunch of things. So if you wanna find the weaknesses and you wanna know where to attack, you just figure out what this one service is comprised of, and you just start picking off the pieces, right? Same as if you're auditing and you're trying to find the risk of a cloud service, generally the biggest risk is not the vendor you're actually talking to. If the vendor is willing to sell to you as an enterprise, they've thought about security. They at least have one dude in the back room that they keep chained to the desk to answer security questionnaires. There's at least that guy, right? But what your real risk is, is what services are they using? So let's say they're a cloud service and they're using a messaging system or queuing system, whatever the hell Ruby calls it these days. Maybe they're using Redis to go. That's a really, really common one. A lot of your cloud services offload their uh, queuing systems to Redis to go. So maybe they're using Redis to go. Well, if you ever notice, Redis to go doesn't sell to the enterprise. There's a reason they don't sell to the enterprise. Redis itself is not secure. Redis itself doesn't support encrypted transmission. Boom, there you go. There, that is a weaker point than say, Heroku or Salesforce are one of the front doors that you're probably auditing. So if, you, if we go back, now you understand why I spent so much time on this of saying, hey, cloud services are a stack of things. Understand what's in there. Think differently on your approach. Don't think of it as like I'm assessing this one box, this one application. It's a hodgepodge of some good, some crap that's in there. So you have to start thinking about that. Uh, same goes with like all the email sending providers, email sending solutions from the cloud. That's, a, that's my favorite one to attack. Those are easy. Those are really fun. Okay, now, if you wanna know where to really look, like to dive into an actual, just one single provider, this is a list that starts with it. So we talked about the things, right? Go look at all the things that make it up, and I still think that's the most important, because that's where you're gonna find your weakest links, and that's where you're gonna be able to attack one thing and then bounce through to get back to the more secure service or more secure service that they're trying to sell you. But the other things to start to look at is where data stored, how it's stored, and how it's transmitted. This is a big one in the cloud, right? Um, in the enterprise, 
for a very long time, we've had the methodology of uh, if you hit a website and it's HTTPS, we're going to terminate the SSL at our load balancers, our front end, and then we're going to go plain HTTP back to the back end, right? Now, this has started to change a bit as uh, it's less expensive to do full SSL all the way through, right? The crypto is not as expensive anymore uh, to do. But this you know, still is pretty legacy and, and stays in place in many organizations. Well, the problem is that same legacy design carried over to the cloud many times. So then when you start looking at cloud providers and you realize, oh, well, they run on top of infrastructure providers like EC2, well, now your data is flowing unencrypted inside a public network, which is essentially a public network, right? EC2. Now, EC2, my buddies at EC2 Security will tell you, oh, we tag packets and we do all this and it's secure and whatever. Somebody's going to screw up, right? It's going to happen. Um, it was about maybe six months ago, EC2 screwed up their load balancing configs and responses were coming back from the wrong pages from different customers. So there's a perfect example right there, right? It's, it's no longer a what if, it's no longer theoretical. It actually happened. So anybody that was, that was transferring HTTP, stuff was just coming back. You were getting the wrong responses. It was just crazy, it was chaos, right? But the people that were flowing full HTTPS all the way through their stack didn't have this problem because it wasn't possible for it to happen in that scenario. So, you know, we just took a theoretical and made it real. So understand the insides of, uh, of where your data is. Is it commingled uh, with other customers? So if one customer logs on an application, they exploit it, do they get your data? Uh, network configuration, same thing. Like, is your data side by side with somebody else's? Then we, you know, and then that moves back into the encryption side and not just from the transit side, but from the backups. Where are the backups in the cloud? Are they stored in the cloud, off-site, all this kind of stuff? Are they you know, encrypted, all that kind of thing? Same with the data storage. If they're storing it off on things like Redis, Redis queuing system, hugely popular in the cloud services. It's amazing. Like I know the guys at GitHub, I know the guys at Workday, I know all these companies, and they all use kind of the same technology stacks, which is really, really interesting. So if you listen to the very specific things that I talk about, that's your roadmap for attacking any one of these. Um, but uh, they, you know, they all kind of have the same similar weaknesses, which is always funny. Uh, and then the next thing is you get down to the architecture, right? We all know architecture reviews. We all, we, we all go through there and we talk about, okay, how is this set up, blah, 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 whatever. But one interesting thing is, and I love to point this one out again, like my story, is what's the true risk of the various things based on architecture? So for instance, if there's a SQL injection in a front end um, application for a SaaS provider, is it possible for that attacker to get to your data? Right? And I see some heads yes, I see some heads no, I see some heads like, nee, I don't know. The question is, you don't know until you do the architecture review. Because it may be multi-tenant environment, it may not be. It, they may use separate database uh, accounts to access data per customer, they may not. You don't know. SQL injection in itself is not always dangerous to you. You just don't know. You have to know more about it. So I always tell everybody, make sure that as you go through there, you start looking at the actual architecture, how these things stack, and um, how the risk actually affects you. Now, anybody want to add anything? Like, what's the number one thing you look at if you audit a cloud service? I heard, some, I heard something from down on the side earlier. No? Nothing? Location. Location. Okay, so like physical location of where it's, where it's stored? This is a great one, right? So physical, he said physical location of where your data is stored, right? So you have residency issues, you have, oh my God, is my data being stored in Iran? What are they doing with it? You have safe harbor issues with EU, all of these great things, right? Um, I mean, personally, me, I use cloud service providers out of North Korea. Feel secure, they got nuclear weapons and stuff. I like it, it's good stuff. Eh, whatever. All right. So, um, and then the last thing to assess is, does the vendor do assessments? If the vendor does assessments, get their assessments from them. They'll save you a lot of work, but make sure you look at the scope of those assessments. Too many vendors say, hey, we're PCI compliant, and they walk away. Yeah, what part of your environment is PCI compliant? And do those controls carry over to any other part of your environment? Generally, no. PCI, total environment. PCI, total environment. So watch out for that. It's all marketing shit. As you can see, I pull no punches with the cloud vendors. I love these guys. All right, so uh, once you start talking about that, then we get into kind of the protection side of things. So, um, you know, how to protect yourself and how to, you know, properly utilize uh, cloud services. So um, I'm just gonna skip the first one. That one's pretty obvious, you guys get that. Um, but the next one is uh, the audit. So this is a really interesting one to me. So most cloud providers don't provide a lot of audit logs for you. 
They don't allow you to backhaul them. There's some that are. So Salesforce, for instance, they're working on uh, being much more transparent. Heroku, uh, they tend to log about three terabytes of data a day just in logging data. Uh, you can export all of your data there. You can get it real-time streams. It's easy. But these are, these are newer, more progressive thoughts. Uh, most of your providers don't allow this. And so you got to get a little creative sometimes. But you can generally do things with the APIs. Uh, monitoring different transactions, change of state of settings, you know, crawling, but it's usually very customized solutions. Uh, but there, there are some vendor solutions starting to come on the market to help with this, uh, thank goodness. But this is very, very important. Uh, and then continuous audit. How many of you guys do continuous auditing right now? How many people understand the cost of a continuous audit? Okay, let's spend, let's spend a second on that one then. Okay, so continuous audit. So I wrote a framework about, I'd say two years ago when I was a CISO at TiVo. I wrote a framework. It was called Kaka. Okay, it was uh, continuous, continuous, uh, continuous automated auditing. No, continuous audit controls automation. That's what it's called. So Kaka, and the concept behind Kaka. That's right. It's, I named my framework after poop because it was the shit. Thank you. Um, you guys weren't getting there, so I was like, God, lead the horse to the water, make you drink it. Okay. Anyway, so um, the concept behind this was I was tired of my staff spending so much time on auditing every six months when some random ass auditor came in my office and I was tired of finding um, discrepancies in my controls and I was tired of spending so much time on responding to trivial attacks that we just made an automated framework to do all this for us. It would go out, it's much like just a monitoring system. It would go out, it would check a control, it would test the control, so a very simple one. Active Directory uh, policy, it would go out, it had a test account, it would try to change the password on the test account to a uh, password that didn't meet the complexity requirement. If it was successful, control failed. If it was not successful, control was intact. And there we go, we had a whole, full audit log, all of this, right? It was great. It was this thing that we wrote, and shit, it was in Ruby, whatever. Um, but it, it worked out well. Um, yeah, I gotta eat my own dog food on that one for a second. Um, but anyway, so the concept behind continuous auditing was we could just audit all the time and we could find when the state of a control changed and then we knew about it in pretty much neo real time, right? And so you take this and you start to apply this to a cloud provider where you no longer manage the security controls and you can't run a pen test every day and you can't run source code uh, auditing tools on every release. You just don't have this visibility. So you shift a lot of your uh, actions and your time to the audit function. Well, as we know, audit is time consuming, can be boring, sorry auditors, but it can be. Uh, and so we need to move to using the APIs and automated tool sets to constantly test the security of these platforms, constantly test to make sure that our settings and our preferences and everything are in place, and, and you know, basically just give us that real time knowledge similar to what we would have if we own the application and the infrastructure, okay? So that's the concept behind continuous auditing or, you know, caca, because it's the shit. Anyway, so, uh, and then we talk again about the uh, communicate intent, not implementation. I, again, I put this one on here because it's a big one. If you work with the vendors, you talk to the vendors and you say, hey, here's the intent, this is what I'm looking for, it generally works out much, much better than coming in and saying, hey, install some Cisco ASAs for the hell of it, you know, because many vendors will do whatever you want and it doesn't really actually give you what you need, you know, uh, to secure your enterprise, which is quite unfortunate. So. Um, so I heard somebody talk about HIPAA. We talked about data residency, so we have some country lines there. Um, what are some of the other big concerns that people have with uh, cloud services and providers? Go ahead. If they have a seasoned security expert on their team? Okay, that's a great one. So um, I'm trying to think how to answer that without offending too many people. <laughs> Um, okay, so the companies that will generally sell into the enterprise have generally thought more about security and will generally have better security people. The people that are hesitant to sell enterprise or don't target the enterprise, like your consumer-based applications and services, they're the ones that you definitely have to watch for. But just crawl LinkedIn and you'll generally find who the security people are at any organization. And then you'll be able to rank them out and look across different organizations and see how they, you know, who they know, who you know, and all that kind of stuff. But the biggest thing I say is, is go back to the communication, have the discussion with the guys, and you'll know in five minutes if you think they're seasoned enough. Uh, but the big, big thing to look at is not how seasoned or knowledgeable the security team is, but how influential they are in the organization. Right? You can have the smartest security people on the planet, but if they can't get things done, either because of their own inability or just because the organization doesn't want to, then it doesn't matter, it's all for naught. 
Uh, what are some of the other big problems or concerns you guys have? Anybody? Okay. Oh my God! Somebody actually mentioned SDLC. Um, okay, so his, what he said is, if they fall in SDLC, right? So uh, are they throwing crappy code out there? Are they assessing their code? You know, is it secure? You know, what they're doing? Um, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and just tell you, most uh, most uh, cloud providers don't. <laughs> most cloud providers, unless you're unless they're the really really big ones like Salesforce. So Salesforce.com proper, right? They have a very structured program and all. They have to, right? You got J.P. Morgan on there and all this. And as you trend down from there. Cloud is like the wild, wild west. These are like software developers who are, who are like, what, I don't have to ship code? Awesome, I'm just gonna throw it in production. Unfortunately, that's how many of the cloud providers work. And again, it goes back to that whole stupid Ruby shit about people, Ruby developers not knowing what they're doing. No, I'm just playing. Um, but no, it's just, the cloud services, um, so like at Blue Box, we, we have two sets of code. We have on-device uh, security code, but then we have our security platform. And I got two different kinds of developers. My guys that are on platform are like, it's a platform, we can just throw it out there. I'm like, whoa, whoa, no we can't. I'm like, we can't do that. So that's a really good one to watch for because the security controls uh, around who is putting code in production, how fast it's getting out there and if it's been audited is a big one in the, in the cloud providers because you don't have the luxury of it being behind your corporate firewall and, and loose practices are okay sometimes and all that. It's out there, it's public. You and your you know, best friends in Iran, North Korea, Syria, whoever's attacking us today, um, can all attack it and play with it all day long. Okay. All right, so one more. Who, uh, oh, way in the back. Okay, so we'll do both of you, but this one first. Support and what can they see? <laughs> yeah, they can see everything, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, so this is an interesting one to me. So, I just had this discussion with my team, right? Because like I said, we have this platform and we can see a lot of data for our customers. And you know, one of my guys is, um, let's be honest, he's a, he's a fucking hippie. Um, and he's like, Adam, Adam, privacy of the user, man. We can't see their data. We gotta protect it. And I go, man, how are we supposed to protect it if we can't see it? I don't know, man, we gotta figure it out. And I'm like, dude. And then I just end that conversation because that's like my big Lebowski and I'm done, right? That's all I got. So anyway, uh, in the cloud providers, it's a very interesting one, right? So if you go back to enterprise and you think about it, who can see your data inside of enterprise when you're hosting your own application, right? Your network admin, your sysadmin, your database admin, whoever, right? These guys can all see it. The same applies to the um, cloud providers. They have people who can see your data, right? Unless you're doing encryption on your side and then stuffing the encrypted data to them and they don't have the keys and all that, they can see your data. Now they may have policies never to look at your data, and they may tell you they do those policies, and many probably do follow that, but you run the inherent risk of somebody can see your data, and it's just whether they're ethical about it, honest about it, and follow some kind of best practice or some kind of safety guidelines, uh, so they don't screw up your data or disclose your data when they're looking at it. But they can all see your data. But it's the same risk that you had when you were hosting inside the enterprise, it's just shifted outside of your enterprise, right? So actually, I take that back. The risk can actually be slightly different uh, based on their controls, but it's the same, Problem essentially. Okay, there was another one in the back, right there. Availability. Availability is not a security question. Who cares if it's up? When it's down, it's secure, and nobody can hack it. Let's be honest. <laughs> that was always my favorite one. Like when uh, when like a platform would go down, I go, shit, my job's done for today. I'm good. <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> go to lunch. <laughs> Um, no, so availability, uh, so I, I'll take the question, I'll talk about it. So availability in the cloud services, uh, most of the cloud services that you look at don't have SLAs uh, on purpose. When you go out there and you look at it, and they, they'll say, we achieve for, we strive for. These are awesome intents, but they're not guarantees. So be very, very careful about that. Most of your cloud services out there don't have solid SLAs unless they are highly focused on the enterprise or you're a big ass customer then they'll give you an SLA. The rest of them, they'll give you something that sounds fancy, but then when you like calculate the actual number of nines that they just gave you, you realize it's like, I don't know, a month, a year, they can actually be down. You're like, oh shit. Like math always wins. Um, so don't, don't fall for the marketing on that. Uh, but uh, many of these services are getting better on the availability, uh, especially in the cloud where they can be redundant and we can actually you know, architect properly because we don't have the restraints of physical hardware and space. Um, but like I said, most of it is intent. Okay, uh, one more. Go ahead. Okay. 
Right. So, um, so the question was around liability. You know, if the cloud provider fucks up, I'm glad somebody else drops the f bomb this early in the morning, just like me. Um, if if the uh, cloud uh, provider fucks up, you know, where's the liability, right? If it's a regulatory thing, if it's uh, one of their customers, you know, whatever it is, where's the liability? Um, yeah, this is an interesting one. So I know of a cloud provider. I was just talking to an insurance company uh, last week, uh, and they had a cloud provider, and this uh, that they wanted to do business with. Huge, like they were like all in. We love you guys. Want to do it? This is exactly what stopped the contract, unfortunately. Um, the cloud provider would not agree to the liability terms that the insurance company wanted, and they weren't even putting claims data or you know, anything like that. This was for their just internal operations, you know, whatever stuff, right? Um, and the cloud provider would not accept the liability. They were too afraid of the liability and what it can mean. This is a big one. This has been a problem for a long time with hosted and outsourced providers. Um, you see it a little bit with like consultants, but not as much. We kind of got over that and got standard terms around it. But cloud providers are still scared to say, yes, I'm going to take this liability. I'm going to you know, go up to these limits, whatever. Some will do it, but many of them are worried about it, and with good reason. I will defend them a bit on this one. So many of these cloud providers, they don't know what data you're really going to shove in there. You say, oh, I want to use it for my internal request tracking, right? And then some dude shoves some customer data, client data, patient data, whatever in there. Then it's compromised, and now the customer has a you know regulatory fine, and they want the cloud provider to pay for it and deal with it. When in reality, like, hey, the terms of engagement were slightly different. They didn't know about that. They didn't know that's what it's going to be used for. So a lot of these providers hedge very heavily. So we talked about Salesforce and HIPAA a minute ago. So disclaimer: love Salesforce. They're my fam, right? But they hate HIPAA data. Right? Salesforce does not want to deal with HIPAA. The regulations, the liability is too much for it. They push back everywhere they can. When I was at Heroku, we would not sell to somebody that was healthcare. If somebody came to us and said, you hey, want to put HIPAA data, we'd go, later. I don't want your money today. I mean, I literally, it pained me because I'm a greedy capitalist, right? And it pained me to be on a call and be like, sorry, I don't want your business. Like that just killed part of my heart right there every time I had to say that, right? Um, but at the end of the day, we did not want the HIPAA data because I didn't want the liability because it was too big of a liability for me because I didn't know what they were going to do, if they were going to screw up, if we were going to screw up, whatever. So this is a really, really good one. If you have sensitive data, if you have big liability requirements, make sure you're on top of that. Okay. So we'll go ahead and uh, start to finish up and then get to some Q&A. Um, but you know, this is kind of what to know uh, when working with providers. This is uh, kind of an overview of some of the stuff that we talked about there. Um, you know, everything from the transfer of risk management to uh, you know, understanding that all the providers are different and working with the providers and picking the providers around that, uh, that work with the risk levels you need, which tied in perfectly here to this liability question that we just had, right? So have the open dialogue, really work with them, understand their stack of things to find those weaknesses and what to attack and to go after, and it's going to make your life much, much easier. But understand, for $8 a month, you're not getting the best security in the world. It's just, it, economically, it just doesn't make sense, right? It's not going to happen. So if you want, like, I don't know. I was going to say government-grade security, but we all kind of know the government scorecard and security. So, yeah, I don't know. We're going to say, if you want the level of security that my organization has, let me put it that way, um, you know, $8 a month probably is not going to get you there. But the ideal scenarios that you're looking for in cloud providers, these are a couple bullet points of kind of some of the ideal things that when you talk to cloud providers, you talk to them about and you say, hey, do you have these things? Kind of help me understand. These are some progressive concepts in security uh, that in the cloud is very easy to put in place. So for instance, the first one, disposable systems, right? So like my platform that we run um, and at Heroku and uh, I, think, uh, I think Box does this as well, um, we treat systems as part of a version release. So when I was at Heroku, we never had an operating system like a server instance, a virtual instance in production longer than 32 days. 32 days was the oldest that any instance was ever in production, meaning it could never be vulnerable to anything older than 32 days because every, th every time we booted an instance, it was auto-patched. Every single time, auto-patched it, right? And so we treated systems as they were disposable. They were part of the release. So if we were going to roll code, we rolled full instances. I didn't hand patch. We didn't roll a piece of code. We rolled a full instance. This is a great concept, and your cloud providers can do this, so talk to them about that. And if they're doing it, it's a big win because patching, vuln management, all this stuff, becomes less meaningful. Um, it's still meaningful, but much less meaningful. It's not a primary control. It's a secondary control at this point, right? Config management being automated, again, because you can roll systems. You have APIs. Everything's virtualized. This is really, really easy to do. And this is where you want your cloud providers to be. Uh, and then uh, security events as part of operational monitoring. This is something that 
I see some enterprises doing, but interestingly enough, I'm seeing a lot of cloud providers move to this before anybody else. And, and I'm not sure why. I can't put my finger on it. It's not a cloud specific thing. I just happen to see this trend is that they're treating their security alerts and their missing patches and their patch notifications, all this, as part of their operational monitoring. And so now it's coming up in, into the dashboard in front of their IT ops guys or their NOC or whatever. And now if a patch is missing, like soon as that advisory comes out, boom, it's right there. They roll the instance and they're good in 20 minutes, right? So at Heroku, we used to roll our entire fleet. And the fleet fluctuated based on load, but you know, on average, we probably had 21 to 2200 servers. In an emergency, we can roll the entire fleet in sub 45 minutes. I did it twice in one week. There was an open cell vulnerability that came out. The vendor patched it. Two days later, the vendor said, whoops, that patch actually was not complete. Here's another one. We rolled the entire fleet twice in one week. No downtime to customers um, and no faults in the environment. Right? And we were able to do this because we had patch notification in our operational monitoring. So it came up, we saw it, we go, oh, that's a crit, let's go handle that. We had com automated configuration management, so when an instance came up, boom, it was already built, it, or it got built to what it needed to be. Uh, and because we treated everything as disposable, there was no persistent storage on anything, everything was easy, we just flipped the switch, everything was gone, and we were up and running. So these are things that are progressive in the cloud space, and when you start talking to your vendors, these are the kind of things you think about. Also, if you're doing an assessment, if you're a pen test or vulnerability, uh, or you're doing vulnerability assessments, these are the things you think about. Think about how old the systems are gonna be, how the configuration management's done, and realize that a lot of the cloud providers are moving to systems like this, so you need to be on top of the vulns that you're testing and, and make sure you're testing the new stuff versus a lot of the old stuff, because it just probably won't really be there. All right, so that's uh, about all of my ramblings that I have for this morning at uh, like 9.30 or something in the morning. Um, well. I guess it was like 6.30 my time when I started this. Awesome. Thanks to whoever scheduled me first. Appreciate that one. Um, so uh, any questions? And we can go any which direction you guys want to go. It doesn't really matter much to me. But any questions around assessing risk of cloud, specific cloud providers, how shitty Ruby developers are, whatever. I don't care. I could. Okay, so the question is, what if the um, cloud provider doesn't allow you to collect logs? So once the user is on the platform, doing their thing, uploading all your company secrets, mixing it with their porn, whatever it is that they do, you're completely blind to all this, right? Yeah, so all of you people that just smirked about porn, <laughs> you're the ones doing it. Okay, so anyway, um, it's a great question. It's a risk question, right? It's uh, how much risk do you want to take and, and how willing are you to be blind to that situation? Um, what you can do in many cases is, um, if it is a, if it's a, like a SaaS service, right, if it's a web-based service, uh, you can log the uh, traffic coming off your network to their network, uh, and then inspect that traffic and try to make, you know, um, guesses based on that. Now it's not complete because you don't get what's outside of your enterprise, but it gives you some visibility list at least. Um, the other thing you can do is a lot of these providers have APIs so that you can uh, do different things. You can inspect data that's there, you can crawl data that's there, that kind of thing. And so um, automating, being able to go out there, inspect what the data is, look at the actions, and doing uh, state change detection. So looking at going in, for instance, and saying, okay, here's the admin settings that I expect to see. Log into the API, check those settings. Are they still intact? Yes, no. Oh, okay, who was the last person to log in? It's not great. This is not complete and this is all custom. But this is what I'm seeing some organizations do to come over it. The real answer is talk to the provider and just push on them. And if you have, if you know other companies, use your local groups. Like if you have local groups of businesses that get together and talk security and everything, and you guys are all using the same vendors, leverage that and lean on them. A lot of these bigger organizations are starting to move to this. It's just when you look at their feature list and the priorities, it's down a little bit because it's behind the other 10 things that the business users want who are ones paying. But I can tell you that um, leaning on them with your groups helps a lot. That's how Salesforce's uh, new login implementation actually got prioritized is about 15 um, CISOs in the Bay Area kind of got together and leaned on Patrick, who's the chief trust officer at Salesforce. Patrick was like, ah, oh, crap. This is like 15 like big companies, some of our biggest customers. Yeah, this got prioritized, so work with them. Uh, I think there was a question over here. Yes. Yeah, Microsoft sucks. No, it's fine. No, it's fine. Um, yeah, so uh, one of our customers actually uses uh, Office 365. Uh, we have test accounts on the platform uh, for some integrations that we do. Um, it's no worse and no better than any other service that's out there um, from the assessments that I've done of it and uh, the ones that I've seen from my customers. Um, I actually know a couple of the guys who run security on that side. 
uh, over there. Um, the great thing is that it's Microsoft, they're very visible, and so they have to deal with that, that visibility in the market. Uh, a big security breach affects their um, stock price. So um, they're much more responsive and proactive than a lot of the security or a lot of the service providers in that same space. Um, you know, there's some others that are very security minded, but uh, you know, they're one of the better ones in that space because of who they are, honestly. Yeah. You know, that's a great question. It's something I didn't really uh, address. Um, so he asked uh, instant response in the cloud and coordination with the customers, um, you know, when uh, something happens bad in the cloud. Honestly, poor. Uh, most of it's really, really poor right now. Um, and it's kind of how the space has grown up, um, that they've been kind of outside and they're like, we manage it, we take care of it. That's their big business proposition and sell. So that kind of carries over to the instant response and the security as well. Um, so it's very unfortunate. We're starting to see some of these providers be a little bit more progressive, a little bit more open, because they're getting burned and flogged when they're not. Um, but for the most part, it's poor. So the best thing to do is when you negotiate contracts with these providers, have a contract uh, or have a stipulation in there that basically says that you're notified within X amount of time of, of any security events. This is what you're supposed to be told, and here's the regular checkpoints, et cetera. And if you put it in contractually, their legal teams will follow it. They'll make sure. Yeah, and that's what comes back to the immaturity and the, oh, there's no SLAs, it's all best effort, right? Uh, so your bigger ones, your guys that are selling to the enterprise, so your box, your Workday, your uh, DocuSigns, your sales forces, these kind of guys, they'll negotiate those terms and they'll put them in without problem. Your smaller guys, $8 a month, they're probably not really looking, so it's okay. All right, so uh, one more question, anybody? Okay, cool. All right, uh, I'll be around for most of the day, so if you want to chat about the security providers or whatever, uh, give me a shout and we'll talk. Thanks.